So now you know that it's been five years, you know, since this concept of Moneyball, you know, came out. We, we're going to have a good conversation about what's working, what's not working, how uh, venture capitalists and angels and LPs are working hard to figure out who's going to be, you know, the next Facebook here, overseas, and who are the good investors. But before, you know, let's make some introductions. Danielle. I'm Danielle Moore. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Mattermark, where we provide tools to help investors evaluate companies and collect a lot of the data that we'll be talking about that could help you be one of those Moneyball investors. Hey, guys. I'm Jared Engelberg. I'm the head of venture operations and data science at Funders Club. Funders Club is the world's first online venture capital firm. Our focus is to take the key aspects of venture capital, which is discovery, vetting, conviction to invest, and value add, and scale them through software networks in a returns-focused fashion. Um, the impact of what we've done so far, we've been around for four years. In that time, we've invested in 195 companies uh, in 17 countries. We have 17,000 LPs on our platform across 50 countries. Um, the 195 companies that we've invested in, every dollar that we invest has gone on to raise over $20 of follow-on capital um, from investors like GC and Lightspeed and Sequoia and Dreesen, uh, you name it, and really excited to be here today. Hey everyone, I'm Leon Wong. So I'm an alum of Lightspeed and also SV Angel, but uh, recently been on the road raising for my new fund, which is going to launch this summer, Spectrum 28. And yeah, I just finished talking to some LPs about what kind of data I'm going to use to choose the companies. Excellent. So um, with that, you know, let's let's get you know like straight into the topic. So you've seen you know probably a ton of angels and VCs be your customers. What's working? Um, well, we are definitely seeing that people are very interested in data. So when we started three years ago, the discussion of whether or not you would use data, people still were saying, like, I don't think I would do that. You know, why would we do that? Our associates already do it uh, manually. Why do we need software? Like, let's just torture them some more. Um, and I think things have changed a lot. So I think a few firms really took the lead and, and kind of started telling trend stories. You've probably all heard, you know, some funds like Greylock and... Um, Google Ventures were pretty well known for having some amount of data platform. And I think there became curiosity because LPs would say, why aren't you guys doing that? Why isn't Lightspeed doing that? And so as that curiosity spread, we've just seen people going and exploring. And I think half of it is just the associates saying, look at what I made. Look at what I found. And then you can't unsee that. And so I think that's just led to this discovery that this is really interesting and exploring that further. Nice. So uh, are firms now hiring more associates to be using all these tools? Some uh, some are hiring less, too, just depending on what they were having them spend their time on. But fundamentally, they're probably spending their, more of their time talking to humans. Fabulous. Um, so at, at Founders Club, you have an interesting model. D d and, and since you are the head of data science, how are you using data to evaluate what makes it into the platform, what doesn't make it? Yeah, totally. So I think one interesting point to bring up as I'm speaking to this room as Kevin identified, many of you guys are investors who are LPs. It's kind of an existential crisis, right? Like uh, Daniel is saying, will data make less associates get hired, less GPs be used? And for us, we see the world in two sides, right? I think as we think about Moneyball for VC, we think about the company data side, right? About the founders and the traction of the company. And that's always been, I think, in people's minds, the holy grail, right? Can you predict an outcome of a company? But on the Funders Club platform, uh, as an online VC, we also have a, an entire other side of our data, which is our investors. And if you think about each of you in the audience, in a way, you are actually a data science machine. You have a lifetime of experience. You bring in company about a data, and then you put an output out. And we're very mindful of that as well. We now have uh, thousands of investors investing on our platform. We've had tens of thousands of active pieces of feedback, people opining on companies, as well as tens of thousands of pieces of passive feedback, did you invest or not? And we're now four years in, we're starting to see data cycles emerge. And so we're looking both at the company side, but also the investor side. All right. And, and Leon, you know, I know you did some interesting stuff with your previous employers, but now at Spectrum 28, since you have very diverse, you know, um, themes that you're pursuing, what's, what's working right now, you know, for Spectrum 28? Well, a couple of my partners were early investors in Palantir. So when I look at data, how we use it, there's proprietary data and then there's public data. And I think a lot of the public data, you shouldn't have to regrind yourself. It doesn't make sense. And if you have an associate doing that, that's kind of a waste of time. You should just acquire that data. So then the question comes to where can you have proprietary data? Do you really have proprietary data around certain consumer apps like Snapchat? It's harder 
because that's not so proprietary er early on. But in certain other industries, you can have the proprietary data because that proprietary data comes from the customer. So if the customer is, for example, uh, we invest in an area like construction, there's a lot of proprietary data there because their projects, how they're planning to roll them out, the timing, all of that data is critical for the amount of the size of market growth and you can apply, combine that with the public data and that's how you get a perspective on the market. So I think in certain, if you have a vertical approach, then you can develop some insights when you combine it with a reliable public data source. Very cool. So now you know that since you know you raised your fund recently, did you tell your LPs, hey, you know, like a good chunk of our management fees, we're gonna spend it on data sources? So that's a, uh, we actually did call out that the data component of the fund was called out in how we would spend our fees. So we didn't uh, line, itemize the line item as, as matter, matter mark, but I think there are, there's an expectation that there's a speed and velocity that goes beyond the human rate of updating. And why would you replicate that? So we did have a budget allocated towards that, but a lot of the proprietary data needs to be done based on trust. So you have to have those conversations with the CEOs, with the board members uh, directly. When you talk about what is your spending priority uh, for the next year, how are you gonna, how, what's the size of the budget, and how are you gonna prioritize that? Those conversations need to be had, so that, that part is kind of uh, difficult to do other than in person. So Danielle, uh, Danielle, do you think you know that this is going to be a growing trend? Like you are going to, you know, be seeing VCs, you know, spend like millions of dollars every year uh, on buying data, proprietary, or you know, through vendors like you. So when you you raise, you know, your last round, and VCs ask you how big is your market, what do you say? Well, so the, so the market for data um, for VCs is not very large. So you know, most investors don't earmark part of their um, management fees for data. It's actually really great that you've done that because it'll give you the flexibility to actually buy the data later. Um, that's not common. So the market for research, you know, it's maybe twenty to forty million dollars a year of research budget. A lot of times, that's going to older tools like Dow Jones or something like that. So when we raised our last round, we were actually much more focused on the way that our data is going to be used by other types of companies. But I think um, th you know, what we're seeing when we have these conversations is right now it's just a couple of associates. But then you start to think about it's not just the data. It's the workflow. So you know, this is a, a Moneyball panel. And really, Moneyball isn't just about data. It's about what do you do with data. Data only matters if you get some kind of insight or deliverable out of it. And I think what we're seeing now is that they're spending money on Salesforce, and they're spending money on a data scientist, and they're spending money on other like cool proprietary ways to get data, like maybe you have your own conference, and you get people to share information with you there that you can't get anywhere else, like where we are right now, um, which is a very smooth move by Dave. So I think it's more the investment goes to all the things in that ecosystem, not just to Mattermark. So uh, when, when this whole you know, like, uh, world was getting started five, six years ago, since the data exhaust was uh, there because of the social networks, one of the questions was make uh, everything in-house or buy you know, from vendors? Um, and, and I remember you know, a lot of uh, VC firms you know, were in the market to hire data scientists or uh, some computer hackers you know, to make these, uh, things happen. Is it uh, something that you guys are seeing right now, like Leon, and Jared, are you guys you know, building stuff in-house now? So I think we do build um, certain we, tools in-house too because the data you get, they come in silos. So I think the next step for a company would do is how do you bring it together? And I think that, that stitching of the data you, have to, uh, you wanna do, especially when you have your proprietary data source. So I think that you end, we end up doing in-house. Um, however, as much as possible, we look globally for uh, data sources. So uh, we look for, um, in India and China, there are holes in the data that's reliable, but those are important metrics for us as we look at uh, can a company address the global market, but those are big holes and those would be places where we'd hope to acquire um, and, and not develop in-house. Yeah, for us, a lot of our builds are in-house. I think generally for venture firms, for many of you out there, one of the issues is that the other buyers of these data sources have different economic models than venture firms do. So we're investors in a company called Second Measure, which sells uh, about 1% of all credit card data they've aggregated, and you can extrapolate that data to understand consumer buying patterns. For someone like a hedge fund, if they're trying to figure out Domino's earnings next quarter, it makes a lot of sense that they'd pay 
X amount of money for that data. For a venture firm, if you're thinking about using X percent of your management fees, when the return is not known yet, it's, it becomes a little bit more tricky. And so when I look ahead maybe three to four years from now, like, are there different types of data sources that would be more useful to venture capitalists than just data on the traction side or on the market sizing side? Can we think about psychometric data, about founders, right? If I think one of the theses of this, of this whole event in general is talking to people. But can we check our gut instincts as investors and think about what about a specific individual makes a specific founder makes us make a decision, right? What aspects of that, of that individual's personality? Can we start to structure data around that? And is that something that, we, that venture capitalists would be willing to pay for, especially at the, the early stages of businesses? So have you built that? I'd love to pay for that. Working on it. Oh, you are? I mean, I think the goal would be to make it so that, say, second measure, like we should do a deal with second measure, and then that should be just another piece of value we create that then you only spend $6,000 a year on instead of going and doing, sorry, I, you know, I don't think the second measure was going to get those deals anyway, right? Like, yeah. VCs are not necessarily, VCs, VCs are cheap, VCs let's just are say cheap, it. Yeah. Like, they're cheap. I mean, that doesn't make sense for them. So we're trying to figure out how to bring the cost of all that data down by aggregating it together. So... Uh, the other thing is, you know, the more data you have, you know, the, the, the more time you need, you know, to, to, to process it and, like, you know, make sense of it. And the signal to noise ratio, you know, may be terrible. So, like, how do you integrate all that, you know, good insights, you know, or data, you know, and translate it into insights as part of the workflow for the decision making of the, of, of the firm uh, or the investor group that you work with? Have you, have you guys, you know, like, come across any, you know, best practices, either yourselves or, you know, through your clients? Love to hear. Um, yeah, I think some of, some of our clients have blown us away. Uh, I think the first thing is having a really good repeatable process. So that Monday meeting is just a wash in data. Every time you pass, every time that you get everyone's opinion, every time that you go and you say how you feel about a market, if that's just a conversation and you're not capturing that, that's your own data exhaust that you're wasting and, and you can never get it back and no one else has it but you. So I think a lot of it is about, right now we're still in the phase of just getting good at collection. Um, I think the second piece is just having clear theses. So I think people talk about thesis-based investing, but I think sometimes that's just marketing BS to raise the fund, and it's not that crisp. So I think it's got to become crisp. You've got to actually write down what are the success the metrics. In the room, so. Oh, don't, sorry, don't they've, been, the secret, they've yeah. been marketing to you. Yeah. Um, but you know, I think that if you said that stuff, you probably meant it. So it's just m being more clear so that you can measure against it. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I think a lot of that is you need a feedback loop. And I think that's the part we build in-house, which is how do, we, how do we monitor whether this was the piece of data that we were tracking? And you gotta be brutally honest with yourself. Like if, if well, we invest in FinTech, and, and it all comes down to then is how good is the debt that they're getting? What are the terms? And if you miss that in your assessment, you gotta be honest and say, how could I have gotten that information uh, beforehand? Because it turns out to be an issue later. But if you're not, and then you ignore the passes or uh, the failures, which is your instinct to, to do, you want to move on, then you don't get that cycle. So I think that being having high integrity on how you're going to use your own decision-making data and feed it back in is uh, it's very difficult to capture. Actually, we still have there's no software for that. So a lot of that is it's it's a painful process and adds to the load of the team. But I think that is a critical thing you need to do as a team rather than as just individuals. Yeah, I, mean, I think one more point on that is venture as an industry is a really nasty data set. There's only about 1,000 companies that are raising in a given year or quarter. You have really, really long feedback loops, as Liam was saying, five, seven, 10 years. There's a lot of idiosyncrasies in the data based on like who's coming in, where, geography. So it, it's hard to really derive true signal, especially on the short term. So best practice is try to find data questions that can be answered on a shorter term, right? Look at cohort analysis for a given company and benchmark that against the rest of your portfolio and say, hey, can we predict the likelihood of retention next month or next year? And I think when you start small with those baby steps and start to build buy-in at your firms around data and data science practices, you can then start to think big picture about these holy grail questions. Um, if everybody becomes an expert in playing this game, what, what would happen you know, to the broader VC market? What it'll do you guys great. think? It'll be so great. Think, I mean, I don't know what will happen to the VC market, but for founders, it'll be awesome. And frankly, like, if founders win, then the VC market wins. 
right? So if we get more liquidity, if money's coming back, you're able to raise more funds, founders are getting money, they're angel investing, they're starting funds, it has a really great flywheel effect. So making investors successful, making founders successful, I mean, I don't know if you guys could di possibly disagree with that, right? It's all win. No, I mean, you have to drink a little bit of your own Kool-Aid, right? We're funding disruptive companies that are helping shape the world with data science practices. I think you have to appreciate when our industry gets helped too. And the fact of the matter is, at least for us at Funders Club, we win when our investors win and when our founders win. And some of the findings that we're having on the data side, we're now pushing out on both directions in our platform. Fundamentally, if we're not making above market returns, we're nothing. I think you can look at corollaries in the hedge fund market where a lot of data and algorithms are used in trading, but you still have hedge fund traders and there's still differences in outcomes based on the traders themselves. Yeah, I think the reality is it will change how VCs have to operate. Just like the previous panel, it's not just choosing the company. Choosing will then be easier in this world. It's that the, the VCs have to deliver. And you have to build much more of your team around how we're going to deliver value to earn a spot to earn a piece of a great company, which is apparently obvious now to everyone. So I think that makes that, that's good. That's a positive change because then you become part of the growing the company, and you, be, you need to become part of that value equation. You can't just be there because you're making the right bets because decision making is now less valued over time, if, if that's the case. So I think it's overall it's gonna produce stronger, comp stronger faster growing companies because VCs are gonna have to apply their talents to that. And I just have to add, the pie is not fixed, right? So that just because there are this many you know, thousand companies that are in market to raise right now doesn't mean it always has to be that way. So a future where there's more choices also means decision making actually does get harder still in, in the ultimate sense. So if we better up our game now so that we are ready for that future market. Excellent. So um, since we have a lot of LPs in the room, how can they benefit you know, from all these you know, data as customers or building some of this, this stuff, you know, themselves. I, I guess, like, abstracting a little bit the question of Moneyball, what did Moneyball really do for baseball? It took what was a gut reaction and built math and pr probability and statistics around that gut reaction to kind of reverse some fundamental biases. And that's what we're trying to do on the GP side. I think that's what you should be trying to do on the LP side, right? Are there fundamental biases that you are engaging with? Maybe you know it and maybe you don't that you can use data and data science to help come up with a more repeatable, informative process for picking up GPs. Yeah, I think the other part of Moneyball is that you look beyond the obvious, right? The guy that's the most charismatic champion that you expect to win may not always be the case, and looking at what are the fundamentals that bring, us the non bring you the non-obvious winner. So I would say, as an LP, you would then push for what, what's the what is the facts that you're basing these decisions on and not just that you have a, there's a great track record, but was it luck or serendipity that brought you that track record or was it something that you have a feedback loop now that you've infinitely sh stronger at? So I think LPs getting more fundamentals would be the application of the money ball to that. So I'll just add one last thing, which is I think emerging managers are so exciting and um, hopefully LPs can use data to go and evaluate them. I think set to what you're saying is looking at them objectively and I think they already are. So I think that one of the benefits you have as an LP is you're taking a longer view and I think sometimes the VC uh, GPs can get very caught up in this deal and uh, kind of the shorter term picture. So you can be value added by reinforcing the long term picture and really actually making these things more effective. You're analytical, you're technical, you're looking at a portfolio. So I think the value added LP might be a, a trend that's coming. It would be, it would be really cool uh, for emerging managers. It would be almost like the MBA draft, you know, like. <laughs> all right, so with that, thank you all for your attention. Thank you for the conversation.